So without any further ado about kind of USC overall and, and so forth, I'm really pleased now to introduce uh, Professor John Wilson, uh, who is our, our, our director and also the author of a um, very recently published volume, Environmental Applications of Digital Terrain Modeling. So John is um, uh, you know, centrally known in the field. He's the editor currently of the GIST Body of Knowledge Project um, with UCGIS. Um, he's an international expert on digital train modeling and a fellow with the Chinese Academy of Sciences in addition to all of what he does to lead the Institute at USC and lead our educational programs. I'm not sure how he found, found time to write a book, but I am um, very pleased that he'll be able to tell us a little bit about it today. Thank you, John. Thank you. So uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk about uh, this book, and I, I want to accomplish two goals while I do this. So the first goal is to give you a sense of how I think about geographic information science and technology being coupled together and how the technology has the prime purpose of helping people execute and build knowledge using the science. And uh, the second goal, uh, you know, that, that pertains and is illustrated by the title of this particular book is to talk about the links between geographic information science and other sciences, uh, like the environmental sciences uh, writ large. And so uh, my, my view of geographic information science and the supporting technologies is it's an enabling science. Uh, uh, it, it, can, it can find uses virtually anywhere. Uh, and with every domain, other domain that you think of, and, and I'm just going to talk about the, maybe the domains this particular book uh, uh, is associated with next. So there's, uh, uh, so geomorphometry is the science of the quantification, uh, science of quantitative land surface analysis. And typically there's a, a if you like, a scientific workflow. So one would choose a way to represent reality, then one would uh, sample the land surface. Uh, one would then create some kind of surface model from that sample. Uh, then you might check for, and if you find them, as you inevitably do, you would try to correct errors and artifacts in that surface model. At that point, you have a final digital elevation model, and then you could use it for interpretation or visualization or might, more likely you'll use it for a series of applications uh, and these applications may have uh, many steps. Now, I, I've been working on this kind of workflow for most of my life at this stage and uh, like most branches of science and particularly sort of the intersection between computation and field science, uh, the world is changing rapidly and the ways, the ways in which we think about science and the ways we conduct science are changing at the same time. So next. So basically we need some, we need some sources of elevation data. And you know, when I started work in the sort of middle of the 1980s on these kinds of topics, 90% uh, of my time and effort was spent uh, taking a, a topographic map sheet from the United States Geological Survey and with a digitizing algorithm, turning it into uh, digital data that I could then calculate, among other things, terrain attributes on top of. Uh, best case, you had a 30 meter product. Worst case, you had a 90 meter product. Uh, when you are finished with that exercise, occasionally in steep terrain, you might be able to produce a 10 meter project product. Uh, but the world has been transformed. Most elevation data today are captured from uh, light plane or satellite. Uh, we have typically point clouds, either from synthetic aperture radar or from LIDAR. And uh, we have very sophisticated algorithms that uh, build sample DEMs and then check for errors and so forth. And so most times today then, there's multiple elevation products. Uh, there's a one meter, three meter, 10 meter DEM available for the whole planet. Uh, and so that, that transforms the opportunities in terms of what we can do and how we can think about using this data source. Next. Uh, to do so, you've, you've got to think of how to structure the elevation data network. The favorite trick so far is to use a, a, a three by three moving window on top of a square grid. 
Uh, that won't work for global analysis typically because if you use a plane and coordinate system, of course, the world's not flat and it's, it's not a surface. It's actually uh, shaped more like a basketball. Uh, on the left, uh, for some applications, we might find added value from thinking of a contour-based network where the, the contour lines, like, like I saw my whole life, drawn on top of a map sheet. Uh, but the lines uh, that are perpendicular to those are the flow lines of water, at least as we imagine it crossing a landscape surface. And then on the right, there's a triangulated irregular network. And much of the, the novel work today typically combines two or possibly all three of these data networks and uses them interchangeably. Next. So at the beginning of the applications, there's typically two things somebody wants to do. So one is they might want to uh, calculate any number of land surface parameters. And there are basically two types. So there's land surface parameters that you can calculate one by one directly from the digital elevation model itself, the primary uh, land surface parameters. And then there are secondary land surface parameters that you derive from two or more primary parameters and perhaps some additional inputs. Almost everything that people are interested in happens either on the surface, just above the surface, or just below the surface. Uh, and, and many of the things that, that shape and constrain or enable what we do in life, in all its various forms, uh, relies on things that happen r right next to us or, at, uh, or locally or maybe even at a distance. And so typically the first decision you have to make with these land surface parameters is first, which ones are of interest for the problem or opportunity at hand? And then second, at what sort of scale do we, do we want or need to look at those? Or are there multiple kind of geographic extents or scales that we look at them? And let's not forget that j just as location is everywhere, so is time. And so we, we might too think about over what sort of time, spe time span we want to look at these things. So next. So what's happened in the last 30 years and what's described in detail in this book I wrote is there are uh, 68 or more uh, primary land surface parameters. Uh, a couple are site specific. There are many local ones. Typically this means they, they, they are calculated over a three by three or five by five moving window. There are 20 regional ones. And in fact, it, uh, you could multiply 68 by about 25 because for many of these things there are uh, options you have to choose in terms of how you calculate them. And so in, in that respect, then there are many hundreds of possible primary land surface parameters that we could calculate and that many people have calculated and published in the last 40 years. Next. And then there are also uh, an ever increasing number of uh, secondary land surface parameters. Uh, they typically fall in two groups. One has to do with water flow and soil redistribution and the other has to do with energy and heat regimes. And some of these uh, are universally applicable, like topographic radiation indices, uh, and some are constrained to particular kinds of landscapes and perhaps uh, particular applications. But there's a, a, a lot of new and exciting work about secondary land surface parameters as well. And many times the, the final application is, is, is not these parameters per se, but then how they can be used and other kinds of work. So next. And so here's, here's an example. In the, in, among the secondary land surface parameters was something called the topographic wetness index. And so this typically tells you where in a landscape you'd expect to see uh, environment, uh, near surface environments that are wetter than others. So if you're keen on mountain biking or hiking and national forests and so forth, and you're a frequent uh, user of a particular forest, uh, you might have noted that there's always spots on the forest floor that are wet and there are other spots that, except when it rains, are dry. And so the topographic wetness index tries to get at that. Here's two photographs I took in 1981 when I was a PhD student. Uh, this is uh, southern Ontario in Canada at the beginning of May. So first problem, we still see snow on the ground. Uh, the second, uh, but we see lots of water running off the land surface and on the right there, you can see that the water's dug a fair depth uh, into the soil. 
And so what's been moving here uh, because of rain and melting snow is lots of topsoil. And the picture on the left shows you a farm field uh, after a, a, the snow melt is finished and after a series of big rain events. And, and this changes the productivity of the landscape because typically the topsoil is the most productive part of the landscape. It has the best water holding capacity, the best nutrients and so forth. So this is the kind of problem that, you, that these land surface parameters might be used to tackle. Next. So, uh, but here's a, here's a sense of how challenging it might be. So here's a picture of the steady state topographic wetness index for a catchment in Montana that's featured in my book. And uh, here's a description of some fantastic work by Buchanan and his colleagues. that was published in 2014 for some landscapes in New York, agricultural landscapes. And they calculated more than 400 different topographic wetness indices for the same fields because they they trolled through choosing different multiple different DM resolutions, different vertical DM precisions, uh, multiple flow direction and slope algorithms. They chose and used smoothing uh, versus low path filtering, and uh, they included or not the relevant soil properties. And they used these to try and get a handle on which approach and which inputs gave you the best topographic wetness maps and and the and the test was measured against observed soil moisture in the agricultural fields. So the point here is there's, you need a lot of knowledge about the domain that you're working in. In this case, it's largely got to do with climate and soils uh, in order to be able to execute, choose and then execute the algorithms inside of GIS appropriately. And I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Next. The other kind of uh, application uh, directly from the DEM is to try and calculate uh, uh, maps that describe different landforms and different landform patterns. And uh, with better data and better algorithms, frankly, this, is, this has got better over time. In this case, the image on the left is a computer version of a map that was, was generated by hand and published in 1964, and for the longest time was thought of as the gold standard in the United States by somebody named Hammond. In the middle uh, is a sort of a computer generated version of that using new algorithms as well as new digital data. Uh, and it was published in 2014. And on the right, uh, using similar, uh, similar tools and similar data is an attempt to recreate uh, Hammond's landform classes for a, a part of New Mexico. Uh, you get better granularity, you get probably better precision as a consequence, and you possibly have a way to measure the confidence you would have in your predictions. Next. Uh, uh, but, but even so, this, that sort of approach might be a dead end, and so these two gentlemen in, uh, in Europe have been using uh, uh, visual analysis to, to, to take this classification a whole different way. So what GIS people have done for 20, 30 years is try and classify pixels and then group similar pixels together to make uh, landforms. And what uh, Dragnet and Isaac do is they try to analyze, analyze the DEM as if it were an image and find areas that have similar properties and then as a second step, try and classify what kinds of landforms they are. And their early work at least shows that this is a very, very promising approach. And these two maps demonstrate uh, uh, how quickly they've been able to generate landform maps for the whole planet. And so this is super exciting. Next. Uh, but typically, uh, this is the, the land surface parameters and the landform maps are just a means to an end. And so here's five extraordinary studies in all different ways. But at the top there, the first study uh, is interested in predictive veg vegeta vegetative modeling for conservation. A big deal if you're interested in species conservation or restoration, these kinds of things. And they looked at uh, how the choices made to develop the uh, landform classification or the surface land surface parameters uh, can have a huge impact on, on, on how, what you predict with the vegetation modeling. And so uh, there's a need for more work here. And the one at the bottom uh, is novel because it, it tries to model the spatiotemporal dynamics of global wetlands. 
which has a lot to do with water balance, with climate change and various things. Although this particular paper, uh, brilliant that it was, uh, is, is looking at how when you feed these terrain uh, results into a, into a global model, uh, how you gain or lose in terms of confidence, uncertainty and things like that. So next. Uh, so plenty of software available to implement these kinds of ideas, either to calculate the land surface parameters or classify the landforms and other land surface objects. Uh, many, many tools, uh, some in proprietary systems like ArcGIS, some in open source systems like GRASS and QGIS and Whitebox, some in uh, specialty software like TAUDM and to some extent Sega. Next. Uh, but you've got to be careful. Uh, how you use them because increasingly what's bundled together are the workflows, the software, the tools, and of course the data. And just as an example, ESRI have now this uh, ArcGIS software platform uh, that has the toolbox and ArcGIS Pro typically, the visualization and ArcMap, and many of the data are delivered as services and they're consumed by your tools or by your applications. And so you, you do this work on the web rather than on, on your desktop. And, and this is, uh, this is a, a pervasive trend across all kinds of computing and one that's uh, super important, I think, for geographic information science and technology. Next. So the last thing I want to say is simply that uh, the future is not, being, is not probably about just being able to drive a GIS uh, workflow but rather to understand and, and to be able to assemble the resources you need to answer questions on the way. So I've been talking this evening about calculating land surface parameters or classifying uh, whole continents or the whole world into landforms. And in order to do that, I need to be able to, I need uh, to decide, or well, how should the land surface be represented? Which of those uh, models do I use? What's the preferred scale and why? What elevation sources are available and which would work best for the opportunity or problem at hand? What pre-processing is required to produce a usable DEM? How will DEM error get propagated and how should this uncertainty be handled throughout subsequent analyses? What methods and data are best for calculating specific land surface parameters? What methods are best for delineating specific land surface objects? Is there a need to develop new land surface parameters and objects to address particular problems? What approaches and metrics or indices are best suited to a particular mapping application and do methods even exist? And does an adequate model exist or do we need to develop and modify one for the opportunity of the problem at hand? None of those questions can be answered uh, by you pecking around a software platform. None of them can be answered by the supporting application probably for uh, most of the software platforms. Uh, and that was my motivation for writing the book. And so the idea is that GIS and the accompanying technologies are enabling, uh, is an enabling science so that people can ask really important and answer really important questions at a whole bunch of scales from where you live, to the county, to the state, to the country, to the continent, to the globe. And uh, I think this is why, this is where the future lies. And, and, and as Bob and Virginia are, going to, Virginia are going to explain, this is, this is what we aspire to do with our academic programs. So thank you. Thank you so much, John. And now we have um, some time set aside for some Q&A. So if anyone has questions um, for uh, Professor Wilson, um, you can send them um, through the chat function down at the bottom. So we'll wait a couple of minutes here um, for people to type out any questions that they have. So while we're waiting, I might put a question to John just to talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the domains where um, in the environmental sciences, for example, where updated terrain models with these sorts of new, new levels of precision um, are going to be key in, in coming years. Uh, well, so one is uh, climatology. Uh, so we can, in most, in most situations, uh, uh, you have climate stations, uh, and maybe you have some, some satellite data about, that gives you measurements about climate as well. And so, uh, but you can't measure everywhere, and the, the, 
the satellite data has strengths and weaknesses. And so in most cases, if you use elevation uh, and perhaps aspect, uh, then you can get a much better climate surface uh, for a whole area. And that might relate, for example, to uh, the viability of solar panels on roofs or on the sides of hills or the, the prospects for uh, precision farming, improving productivity, reducing environmental impact and that kind of thing. And perhaps the best example is that in the United States, we have a, a, a super exciting new national water model, uh, which runs continuously. And, and terrain analysis is and GIS are fundamentally the tools that connect uh, the climatology to the land surface, to the soil underneath, to the vegetation on top of the surface. And so that on a continuous basis at a very fine spatial scale for the whole country, you can, you can predict uh, flood hazard uh, with, with uh, really, really good space and time precision in a way that in the future might help us save lives. Thank you.